Hello friends, I'm Rob, this is Digital Wastrel. This video is about House Goliath, and in honour of the big muscly boys, recently I've started working out, and I can't wait to show you the results. Pretty impressive, I think you'll agree. Anyway, welcome to my Introduction to House Goliath video. This is a guide aimed at new players, so if you're new to House Goliath, or you're new to Necromunda in general, welcome aboard. I'm not going to call it anything like a Tactica, because I'm not good at smart thinking, very smart, but I do hope to provide a good starting point and a vague sense of what you should be doing and how to play the gang. House Goliath are genetically modified big guys who live short, violent lives, and as the whole planet tends to live short, violent lives, that's really saying something. This is just going to be focusing on gameplay and list building and rules and stuff like that, but if you're interested in more background uh, about Necromunda, check out my channel. Uh, I've got lots of lore and converting videos and all sorts. So yeah, give us a look, uh, press subscribe, and let's do some Goliaths. What is in this video? This is what I'm going to cover in terms of uh, House Goliath stuff. Firstly, I'm going to have a, a little bit of an overview, talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the house. Then I'm going to talk about the weapons and war gear. I'm not going to go through each of them, list them off, um, you know, you can read the book yourself. But I am going to give some suggestions for strong options and good ones to take, and then quote unquote bad choices. I don't think there's any truly awful choices in Necromunda. Well, maybe a few, but you know, stronger choices and uh, less strong choices. So you can get a good idea about what to equip your gang with. And then we're going to look at some skills. Again, I'm not going to look over every skill that's available, but I will give some suggestions as to good choices, some good skills you can take. And then I'll be having a look at the muscle skill set, which is Goliath's unique skill set. And then after that, I'm going to be looking at roster building. So just some general things to keep in mind when you're making a Goliath gang. And then I'm also going to be uh, looking at each of the fighter types and giving some suggested uses and maybe some loadouts. And then another piece of advice that I really wanted when I was starting out Necromunda is what to think about after your first few games. It's very easy to uh, look online and find like a list or a roster that you can copy, but you've finished your first game, maybe you've won, maybe you've lost, you've got a few credits, there's a lot of options. What do you want to do after your first few games? I'll point you in the right direction. After that, we'll go on to hobby tips. This is things to know when actually physically building your gang. So how to assemble the miniatures and uh, conversion tips and stuff like that. And then finally, we'll round off the video with four example starting gangs. I'm going to do one box WYSIWYG gang, so just something you can assemble directly from one box. And I'm going to do one box uh, featuring a bit of converting and maybe a few bits with swaps. And then two boxes and an upgrade pack, so that's a gang that you can build if you buy everything from Games Workshop. And then finally, my own personal starting gang which will be basically a roster that I would take into a new campaign. Yeah, so let's go. So let's start with an overview of House Goliath. First up, let's talk about the strengths of the gang. Yeah, firstly, quite obviously, you have great stats. You have a strength and toughness of four, and you have very good cool, and those are all stats that you will use in pretty much every game. Yeah, they're very solid stats. Um, your guys are huge, so that makes a lot of sense. Next up, Gene Smithing. Gene Smithing is the unique House Goliath system. Uh, each house has its own kind of unique rule set to interact with. 
the game and gene smithing is the house goliath it is very very strong um also very very flavorful you can get a lot out of it you can make some real interesting characters and some interesting narrative choices and it's also very good for creating absolute powerhouses on the table very briefly gene smithing is done when recruiting a ganger and allows you to spend credits to give them bonuses to various stats or some special skills and abilities. You can also take penalties on your gangers and reduce their cost. So there's a lot of fine tuning you can do with it. Uh, some might call it crafting the narrative and some might prefer to think about it as min-maxing. I'm not going to go fully into gene smithing in this video. Um, I did do uh, another video talking about gene smithing so I'll put a link to that on the screen uh, you can check that out if you want um, another strength is that they can create some very scary characters you can uh, make some pretty horrible close combat monsters that will destroy anything they touch next up I think that house goliath has a very good house weapon list so this means that even basic gangers can become pretty scary not super strong but most of your guys can handle themselves in a fight and finally i believe that they are surprisingly flexible they hit hard but they do have some ranged options and they do have some kind of uh, crowd control options so it's not just charge forward yelling you got to do some tactics and uh yeah you've got some options for how you build your gang so next up let's have a look at the weaknesses first up goliaths are very expensive you will be probably outnumbered by most other gangs that you fight and you've definitely got to be careful especially with the gene smithing it's very easy to put a lot of credits into a ganger and obviously if that ganger goes down then you're out a lot of credits next up they have very low int willpower and fairly average intelligent um initiative sorry Int and will are not very good. Well, int and will are not very useful, sorry. Willpower is used for psychic stuff, I believe. So if you are fighting maybe Dalak, uh, that might be a problem. Int isn't really used very often. Average initiative does mean that you're more likely than not to fall off stuff. So not a huge disadvantage, but something to keep in mind. Uh, another problem with Goliath gangs is that they are very slow. They're slower even than Vansar, in my opinion. Yeah, Vansar have a type of juve with the little hoverboards. You've probably seen them around, right? And they give kind of maneuverability to the gang. Goliaths don't have any of that. They're just men with feet running at you. So yeah, they have a few ways around this, but generally they're slow, so you need to be, be aware of that. Next up, they don't have any long-range cheap guns and by that i mean low no las guns and auto guns pretty much every other gang can equip its basic basic fighters with las guns or auto guns give you kind of a cheap body that can shoot 24 inches goliaths do have 24 inch range guns but they're expensive so yeah you don't really get a lot of cheap shooting with goliath gang and then finally this is a personal point of view but in my opinion the prospects the special champions and the brute are pretty much all the same flavor your basic goliath gangers are big guys big muscles and that theme is pretty much all you're going to get for the entire gang you know a bit of variety can be nice you can play around with that get around that slightly with gene smithing if you have some ideas in mind for different types of uh, gangers that have joined your team but yeah it's pretty pretty much straightforward theme wise and then finally special mechanics yeah so the special mechanics for house goliath is gene smithing as i mentioned before this is very powerful very narrative uh, and very flexible i would be keep an eye on this because it is possible to like min max your gang so you know keep an eye on making sure you make a fun gang that's fun for you and your opponents it is very possible to tweak everything <clears throat> so yeah i would keep keep it for a narrative thing and for a few special people in my opinion but yeah gene smelling is very good 
excellent stuff. Yeah, and then the final little thing that makes House Goliath special is that they're a cheaper, they get access to cheaper Ogryn. So, you know, if you want an Ogryn in your brute selection, um, yeah, cheap, cheap times. Let's move on to the weapons and war gear. And I'm going to start with uh, what I've called strong choices. These are options that are pretty much always a good choice. So yeah, the first two choices that we're going to talk about are furnace plates and stub guns. So furnace plates are your unique armor. They give you a six up save and a five up save if the shot is coming in from your front arc, which, you know, you'll be facing the enemy. So more often than not, that will come into effect. Yeah, furnace plates are five credits and that's just really good value for armor. Pretty much every ga other gang is paying like 10 or 15 credits for um, armor. So furnace plates are cheap enough that you can give uh, give them to pretty much everyone in your gang. And you'll probably want to sooner or later. Stub guns are amazing. I love a stub gun. Super simple gun. Cheap, reliable. Uh, you get a bonus to hit when you're close. You can put dum dum bullets in there for strength four. When you've got a bit more cash, can't go wrong with a stub gun. I would suggest most people in your gang would benefit from having a stub gun when you've got the credits. Um, yeah, House Goliath is also obviously a famous for being a close combat gang. They want to get up in your face and fight you in close combat. And yeah, they've got a lot of good close combat options. Uh, they get chain axes slightly cheaper than everybody else, I think. Anyway, they do have access to chain axes, uh, and chain axes are very, very good. Some might say they are the strongest weapon in the game. They give you a bonus to hit and a bonus to your strength, as well as rending and parry and a bunch of other weapon, uh, special rules. I think they're the only close combat weapon in the game that gives you a bonus to strength and a bonus to hit. And they're relatively cheap as well. So yeah, chain axes are amazing. For a little bit more credits, you also have the power hammer and the renderizers. Um, yeah, these are very good. They're very thematic and they're very, very cool. Power hammers and renderizers uh, come in the main box set as well. So you'll have quite a few of them hanging about. And yeah, you will destroy anything you touch with these weapons in close combat. And then moving on to the basic gangers, you have access to the Brute Cleaver and the Spud Jacker. So the Brute Cleaver is like an axe, but better. And the Spud Jacker is just like a wrench thing. Um, gives you bonus to strength and knockback. I don't personally rate the Spud Jacker, to be honest. I think it's a little bit overpriced. Um, it's not bad, but, you know, it's not my favourite. Brute Cleavers, however, are very good relatively cheap and pretty nasty so yeah uh, recommended then if we move on to the heavy weapons your house gang list gives you uh, heavy bolters heavy bolters are amazing they will destroy pretty much anything expensive but not so expensive that you can't justify taking one um, when you've got some credits or maybe even at the start of the game if you build around it uh, yeah heavy bolters are very very good yeah, recommended, and they fit House Goliath, I believe. Uh, your basic gangers also get access to bolt guns and combat shotguns, which are two very, very good guns. Expensive, but worthwhile. Bolt guns give you a little bit of threat at um, 24 inches, but they also give you a bonus to hit when you're within 12. And combat shotguns are maybe my favourite basic weapon in the game. They give you the option of putting down a template and yeah, combat shotguns for all of your template needs in House Goliath. Yeah, have some gangers and give them some combat shotguns and yeah, you will have a good time uh, with those loadouts. Uh, next up, grenade launchers. Uh, grenade launchers are pretty much the only special weapon that's worth taking for House Goliath. They are your big crowd control and kind of tech weapon. Grenade launchers being indirect template weapons means that you can kind of target the ground and get people who are hiding around corners. 
their main job is to throw out a template and pin people so that you can get close but you can also put uh, smoke grenades in your grenade launcher and drop down a big smoke template to help your big beefy friends get get closer to the enemy without getting shot to death so yeah grenade launchers also come in the box um yeah grenade launchers also excellent and then finally we've got a piece of war gear called the stim slug stash uh yeah try saying that you know five times uh quickly um yeah the stim slug stashes are a once per game item you do keep them between games but you can only use it once in every game and first up they remove a flesh wound which is very good um, and then they give you plus two movement uh, strength and toughness i believe but basically yeah your guys are slow but you can pop a stim slug stash when you want to charge it'll give you a little bit extra kick of movement and yeah help you make those difficult charges and really make a mess of people in close combat they're a bit expensive so mm, you don't maybe be careful of giving them to everybody at the start but yeah if you have a close combat character you're going to want to give him a stim slug stash sooner or later um next up let's have a look at what i've called narrative choices yeah i wondered about the name for this particular section for a while i was thinking about you know weak choices or trap choices or bad choices but in the end I went for narrative choices because you know uh yeah you can get around you can get away with giving some of these weapons out but just be aware that they're not so uh effective and you know take them with caution but yeah so talk about the this selection I believe that there's very few actually completely awful choices for a Goliath gang they can make pretty much anything work. Um, there are not too many duds in their um, house war gear section. Although that said, um, heavy flamers, mauls, and two-handed weapons are completely awful. So if you have a look at any of the online um, advice columns or tactics columns, uh, or you have a look at any other of the uh, YouTube Necromunda people, Sooner or later, you will hear the piece of advice that says these weapons are awful and, yeah, coming out from me as well. I fully endorse that message. Uh, let me tell you why, just in case you are unaware. Heavy flamers are terrible because they are very expensive and they are move and shoot and they are a short little template. So, you, yeah, difficult to use and incredibly expensive. Um, bad. Mauls, I believe, are the only close combat weapon in the game that give your opponent more armor. Generally, generally bad. And two-handed hammers and axes, despite hitting pretty hard and looking really cool, they give you a penalty to hit in close combat, which, um, yeah, again, you don't really want that. So yeah, avoid those weapons. Um, next up in my narrative choices category, and hold up, let me explain myself before you get to grumpy about this choice. I'm going to say most combi weapons are a kind of be careful about taking these. There are some notable ex exceptions and I've written here stub plasma pistols are amazing and bolt gun grenade launchers might be okay as well but generally I think most combi weapons are too expensive and you'd be better off just buying regular versions of the weapons. So yeah, be careful you don't spend all your credits on combi weapons, is what I'm getting at. And then let's have a look at some of the unique uh, weapons for House Goliath, which are a little bit disappointing. Uh, rivet cannons are your, heavy, I think they're heavy weapon. Um, when this version of Necromunda first came out in 2017, rivet cannons were move and shoot and just completely unplayable. You can move and shoot with them now, and they've got, they're kind of cool, but I think they're basically too expensive and too short-ranged to make it worthwhile. You know, I'd firmly put that in the narrative choice. If you like the idea of them, I'm sure you can buy one and make it work and have a good time with it, but um, yeah, too expensive for what it does, to be honest. Uh, next up, stub cannons. These are the kind of basic 
we uh, weapon that your basic gangers can take. Uh, this kind of replaces the auto gun or last gun from other gangs. And yeah, it's 20 credits, which is a bit too expensive for uh, what it does. 18 inch range, which isn't amazing. It's strength 5, which is good. It's knockback, which is good. But there's no bonus to uh, there's no bonus to hit, and there's no rapid fire or anything. So yeah, stub cannons. I've made a few guys with stub cannons. I think they look really cool, but every time I've used them, they're just disappointing. Uh, not recommended. Then finally, we've got the storm welder and the rock saw. Now these are the weapons that are available to your uh, juves, your um, special juves, and yeah. Storm Welder is kind of crazy. It does a lot of damage, but it's also unwieldy um, and unstable, I think. So it can it can kill your own guys, which is always a positive, honestly. Um, and then you've also got the Rock Saw, which is incredibly dangerous as well. But generally speaking, I think these two weapons are just too expensive. Um, very difficult to use because they're so potentially dangerous. Yeah, just too expensive. If they were cheaper, I think they'd be a fun kind of gimmick option, but yeah, not not recommended, sadly. Alright, uh, let's have a look at skills. So, skills. Um, yeah, these are the skill sets that are available to each of your uh, fighters. Forge Tyrant, who is your leader, gets access to Brawn, Ferocity and Leadership. Forge Boss, who is your uh, champion, the Goliath name for the champion, gets Brawn and Ferocity. And your Stimmer, who is your kind of unique um, champion type, gets access to Ferocity and Muscle. And yeah, the TLDR, or this is a video, so TLDW I suppose, is Nerves of Steel is the best skill. You can probably just skip this part of the video if you want and just give all your guys nerves of steel and yeah that'll get you through most games and not be a bad choice but for the sake of variety we are going to have a look at uh, some of the other skills so yeah strong choices um, these are skills that are kind of good and might be fun to use if you want a bit of a change um, so in the brawn category have a look at bull charge so bull charge gives you bonus strength and knockback on the charge. Um, bonus strength, depending on who's got it and what weapon you have, can you know can push you up into the category of maybe wounding toughness three guys on a two up, or toughness four guys on a um, on a two up as well, depending on the loadout and who has it. Knockback on charge is also pretty good. You can push people off buildings, which is you know pretty much. The best part of this game and you can also smash them into other people and get bonus damage so not bad uh onto the ferocity set ferocity is a pretty good one uh berserker gives you bonus attacks on the charge yeah this is in my opinion especially good for unwieldy combat weapons like the renderizer so unwieldy combat weapons means that um you cannot dual wield you need both hands to hold it which means you lose out from the attack on having a pistol and close combat weapon or two close combat weapons so yeah berserker giving you a bonus attack on charge is pretty nice on these kind of weapons however bonus attacks are always good um nobody who's in close combat will say no to a bonus attack so yeah berserker think about it nerves of steel we've yeah, I've already talked about that. Um, yeah, basically, Nerves of Steel gives you a cool check to ignore pinning. Uh, pinning is the death of your gang. Uh, charge is a double action, so if you're pinned, you cannot charge. Um, pinning will kill you. Cool check to avoid to avoid pinning is amazing. Yeah, it's the best skill. Um, next up, True Grit lets you roll less injury dice when you have to roll an injury dice. Um, and if you have to roll one injury dice, then you can roll two and choose the best one. Yeah, this is a skill that helps you not to die, and you generally want your guys not to die. So yeah, pretty nice. Not a bad one. 
Unstoppable means that you can heal flesh wounds and kind of uh, heal up a little bit during the game. This also helps you not to die, and as previously mentioned, not dying is positive for your gang. So yeah, healing mid-game is not especially common, so yeah, not a bad one to take on. Um, yeah, have a think about it. If you get bored of Nerves of Steel, try some of those ones. Uh, right, yeah, so leadership skills are pretty popular with some of the other gangs. But in my opinion, they are not as useful on Goliaths as other gangs. So the two main things that the leadership skill set gives you are um, the ability to kind of trade away your actions to make your other gangers move quicker, um, overseer, and they also give you bonuses to not uh, run away and all those kind of things. But Goliaths have a low number of individually strong fighters and most of your guys, especially your leader, are going to want to activate fully by themselves. So I don't think they have much use for those kind of skills. And Goliaths also have good cool stats throughout the whole gang, so you're going to be breaking and running away a lot less than other gangs. So yeah, leadership skills are not super useful for the, uh, for the Goliaths in my opinion. And next up... Let's have a look at uh, the muscle skills. So muscle is available to stimmers only as a primary. Um, your other gangers, your other champion and uh, leader get it as a secondary. Um, but yeah, muscle isn't a bad one. Muscle has some interesting choices. Um, and yeah, it's got some fun, fun options, I think. So yeah, first first muscle skill is called Fists of Steel. And this basically makes your unarmed attack have bonus to strength and bonus to damage. So yeah, uh, this might be good on a stimmer that's got the double uh, rapid fire grenade launcher. Um, I don't think it's a strong skill, but it would definitely be a fun gimmick skill. You could maybe build a stimmer with absolutely no... Uh, weapons at all and have him like you know completely unarmed and beating people to death with his bare hands um yeah so very strong narrative choice but probably not uh useful for most gangs next up we have iron man um yeah so flesh wounds do not reduce your toughness every time you take a flesh wound normally your toughness goes down but with iron man your toughness remains uh, maximum until you die you do still die if you take enough flesh wounds, but yeah. So this one is very, very good, and it's especially good if you did some gene smithing and you upped your toughness to toughness 5. Um, yeah, good one. Not a bad one to take. Uh, next up, we have Immovable Stance. So Immovable Stance um, it gives you a new option, a new action that you can do mid-game. Um, a double action, so it's a double action, and you gain bonus armor, and you cannot be pinned by any me by any method. Um, yeah, this one is difficult to use, and I can't really think of too many situations that it would be um, useful to have. The fact that it's a double action means that you're giving up your entire activation, like your entire turn of doing stuff. Yeah, and you've got to get into place beforehand and then waste your activation next turn doing the double action. So, yeah, I don't know. Sounds cool, but it just feels really, really situational. So I would probably avoid that one. I suppose if you used um, Overseer on your leader, you could Overseer to shoot your champion with a movable stance into position then they could activate and then do a movable stance, but yeah, that's uh, that's a bit of a weird one. Probably avoid that. Next up is, and uh, yeah, let me just make sure I'm saying this correctly. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. So yeah, uh, pretty weird to see that written down, but I'm pretty sure it's like the... It's meant to be like the uh, sound effect uh, from Warcraft, the Bloodlust. Yeah, that one? Or uh, the WoW version? 
So this video is like a one minute of just that sound effect loop, so, uh, you know, fun things you find. Uh, anyway, yeah, so this skill, let's, let's focus on that. So yeah, what this skill does is it gives you, uh, you have to make a toughness test, and if you do, then you can take a third action, but you immediately become pinned afterwards with uh, no take backsies. Like, even if you have a skill that makes you avoid pinning, doesn't matter, you automatically become pinned. Yeah, this is another weird one. Third action is definitely good, but because you have to take the toughness test after your second action, it means that you cannot do something like get up and then do a double action. So you couldn't use it to like move and then charge or anything like that. But yeah, it could you could do something like, you know, get up and or move and then aim and then uh, do this one to... Uh, do some shooting. So yeah, a bit situational, kind of cool, but yeah, mostly take it so that you can say say the name of the skill. I think that's probably its most most useful aspect. All right, next one is Unleash the Beast, which is another one which is huge gimmick potential. So basically, this gives you another action. Uh, you can do a big flex for a melee AoE knockback. Um, yeah, you just kind of do knockback attack on everyone in base contact with you. Yeah, again, probably not very useful, but very funny. Um, maybe combine it with Fists of Steel and just have like a big shirtless stimmer running around with no weapons, punching people and, you know, flexing. Um, so yeah, high gimmick value, probably not super useful tactically. Uh, finally, we've got Walk It Off. So this is whenever you do a double move, um, you heal. So yeah, on the first, first glance, this sounds really, really good, but have a think about it a little bit closely. Double movement is usually done at the start of the game, you know, when you're getting towards the enemy, and then you meet the enemy and they do some wounds to you. And then once you've got some wounds, probably you're going to be wanting to do, you know, shooting or charging or fighting. So... I feel like the amount of double moving you're going to be doing after you've taken wounds isn't super high. So yeah, it's maybe kind of a bit more situational than it sounds. But having said all that, any mid-game healing is nice. Uh, it's very difficult to heal mid-game. So anything that lets you uh, get your health back mid-game is, is pretty good. So yeah, if you like the sound of it, go for it. Okay, so let's get on to general roster advice. And here are my starting gang roster tips. Um, yeah, this first one is applicable to almost anybody in the game, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, so for Goliath, boys before toys. Uh, more bodies will generally be better than a fully tricked out gang. And yeah, don't forget this is at the start. So yeah, more bodies. You can always buy them some toys later. But all the toys in the world don't matter if you don't have the boys to uh, play with them. All right, next one. So yeah, your mileage may vary. And uh, other people who have played Goliath may also disagree with this. But my personal thoughts are that you want to aim for about seven bodies minimum as a starting roster. Even if it means just bringing like basic guys with just a five credit stub gun, um, I would try and aim for seven, seven bodies. Uh, you can start with six strong or even five strong gang, um, gang size. It is possible, but it's a huge gamble. So if you have a bad game, like your first game, and you end up with loads of fighters in recovery or even dead, then you go into your next game weaker, and then you lose credits in that game, and then you can maybe death spiral. Death spiral is when you lose games, and so you're not weak enough, so you're not strong enough to win the next game, and then you lose those games, and then, you know, you get worse and worse. It's a pretty big problem in Necromunda, and it's probably the number one um, issue that uh, campaigns have. So yeah, bring bodies at the start, that's your best chance of avoiding a death spiral, in my opinion. Um, and then next up, general general tips. I feel like stub guns and furnace plates are a good choice for pretty much everybody. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit 
earlier. They both cost five credits and they're both very, very useful. Um, depending on your credits, it might not be fully possible to give them to absolutely everybody. But if you find you have a few spare credits after you buy all your main stuff, it's not, it's a pretty good idea to, um, yeah, trick out your guys with a uh, spare stub gun and some furnace plates. All right. So let's have a look at leader loadout ideas. So yeah, your leader is very versatile. He's the only guy in, um, in the gang that's got a decent ballistic skill. So you can go heavy close combat, heavy shooting, or mix of both. Um, yeah. So the typical starting weapons, like from the box and what a lot of people give to their, uh, gang leader are a power hammer and the stub plasma combi pistol. Uh, you can see that's what my gang leader is armed with in that picture there. Um, yeah, this is not a bad choice. Um, I'm not sure it's like the super optimal choice. Uh, there might be more, you know, more dangerous builds or more dangerous weapons you can give them, but this is a good combo. If you give these to your leader, I don't think you'll be disappointed. They'll let you shoot. They'll let you fight. It's, it's a good combo. As I just mentioned before, they've got a decent ballistic skill, so you could also completely ignore close combat and go for a ranged build for your leader. Feels a bit wrong to me. I feel like the Goliath leader should be up, up in the front, mixing it up on the front lines, but you know, if you want to do a ranged leader build, it's completely possible. If you choose this uh, direction, then a grenade launcher or even maybe a heavy bolter, something a little bit different maybe. And the, yeah, the leader is an especially good candidate for gene smithing. Um, you kind of have to be a little bit careful who you give gene smithing to, um, because it's expensive. He is a very good candidate for gene smithing. And yeah, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but gene smithing, you have to do before you, um, or when you buy the ganger. So you can't do it mid, you know, after a few games. He's a good candidate to spend all your credits on for gene spending though, because you know he's your leader and he's going to be getting up to lots of uh, lots of fights, hopefully. All right, on to the next one. So your champion loadout ideas. So Goliaths have two choices for champions. They got your forge boss, um, this fella here, and then you got your stimmer, who is this fella here. Stimmers are huge and full of drugs, and stimmers. Uh, and forge bosses are also pretty huge and also full of um, some degree of drugs. Yeah, so forge boss loadout. This is another kind of suggested by the um, instructions, you know, typical loadout. But a forge boss with a randomizer is a pretty good close combat option right out of the box. Um, yeah, you will kill stuff and it looks really cool. So not a bad choice for a more all-rounded loadout. I really like Forge Boss with Grenade Launcher and Chain Axe. I think this is a very good kind of utility. You can do some grenades, throw some grenades at people, and then when you run out of ammo, you can get in close and Chain Axe people. Yeah, this is a, that's another good, good choice for a loadout, I think. And moving on to the Stimmer, Taking the paired pulverizers, that's the two kind of mini renderizers. Um, yeah, you can see he's got that. Yeah, the stimmer with paired, paired pulverizers is a huge close combat threat. So the paired pulverizers have the uh, paired weapon trait, funnily enough. So that means that you double your base attacks, and they also count as two close combat weapons, so you get plus one attack for that. So all in all, when you charge with paired pulverizers, you rolling something like eight dice so yeah he's a huge close combat threat he will destroy anything that he gets in contact with but be aware that he is a big target like physically he's a big model and you know he's got a big reputation so the enemy will be gunning for him or you know trying to avoid him at least so yeah be aware of that if you just throw him straight out then he'll probably get murdered by plasma guns but yeah he is peak goliath i think yeah, feels wrong to have a Goliath gang without a Stimmer, in my opinion. They're pretty cool. Stimmer, the other option out of the box is the paired rapid fire grenade launchers. Yeah, the well, yeah, it's a grenade launcher and it's paired and it's rapid fire, so it's pretty ridiculous. 
It's also unstable, I believe, so pretty high chance of just exploding yourself. I think this is probably like a bad option. Um, I don't think it's a good choice to take, but if you like the sound of it, it should be very fun and very memorable. Don't know whether you'll kill your enemies or kill yourself, but yeah. Be warned if you go for that option. All right, let's have a look at some ganger. Your uh, bruisers is the name of your basic ganger. Yeah, we mentioned combat shotguns and bolt guns earlier, and they are both very good choices uh, for your bruisers. Very good. Can't can't go wrong with those choices. Expensive though, so be careful when you're starting out. Regular shotguns are a little bit cheaper, so they they give you a bit of a cheaper ranged option if you want some shooting, but um, save some credits. And also with the regular shotguns, you get options for different types of ammo from the trading post. So they've got a bit of upgrade potential. Stub cannons, which you can see my boy there with his stub cannon, sadly. Yeah, they look cool, but they're just, they're, they're not very good. Be warned if you take those. For close combat, axes are very good as a cheap close combat option. I think they're like 10, uh, 10 credits. And the Brute Cleaver is more expensive, but it is available to gangers. So yeah, that's kind of your nicer, fancy option for a bit more of a close combat option. And then moving on to the specialists. So in each gang, every house, I believe, you can make one of your gang as a specialist. And, you know, shockingly, that means they get access to special weapons. I know. Who saw that coming, eh? So yeah, for House Goliath, you have a choice of three special weapons to pick from for your specialists. Flamers, yeah, probably flamers are basically too expensive. If you want a Goliath who has a template, combat shotgun. Like, you know, maybe at a push hand flamer, but I like flamers, they're cool, but uh, yeah, they're not very good in Necromunda, sadly. Melter guns. I would say melter guns are probably too expensive for a starting gang. They're very close range um, and very expensive. So it's entirely possible you get through games without being able to use it because people will run away or, you know, murder you before you get any shots off. But, you know, they are cool. So, yeah, for your, for your specialist, that leaves the humble grenade launcher. Grenade launchers are basically very good. You can start with two grenade launchers. Try not to spam them too much because they are a little bit oppressive. Um, if, you know, if you're fighting against a gang with loads of grenade launchers and you're just getting pinned, it's a little bit frustrating, especially for new players. So, you know, be aware, but one grenade launcher is good and putting a grenade launcher on your uh, specialist is not a bad place to take it. All right, let's have a look at juves. So yeah, the juve options, for House Goliath compared to other gangs, they're fairly disappointing, really. Do you even need to take a juve? Probably not. So yeah, the basic juve is called a bully. And yeah, still movement four, so they don't really give you much utility. Other juves in other houses have slightly, you know, worse stats, but higher movements. So they've got a little bit of utility for, you know, nabbing... Um, ammo crates and, you know, doing objective play, but bullies don't give you that at all. But the good point about them is that they are weapon skill 4 up and strength and toughness 4. So they have the mo the kind of the important stats from your gangers. Um, so think of them as kind of like a cheaper budget version of your basic gangers. So if you do want to take them, keep them cheap. But yeah, they are, in my opinion, completely non-essential. You can get through an entire campaign without messing around with juves. Yeah, Goliaths don't really need juves as much as other gangs, in my opinion. Although, something to keep in mind, depending on what campaign you're playing, you do sometimes get free juves, in which case, you know, have a good time with your free juve, but, you know, be aware you might need to use, you know, buy the model or have a model to represent some juves. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about later about modeling options for juves. You can see my little juve team here. Uh, I get this question quite a lot. These two at the front are my trash goblins. We'll talk about them later. But modeling wise, um, these are 
40k or Gretchen models and um, yeah they've got regular little pistols this guy he's got arms from Gene Steeler cultists and these are the yeah masks from Goliath and I've kind of filled in the back with uh, a bit of green stuff and yeah painted up like a human and yeah these are my little kind of weird mutant gribbly monsters and this guy at the back is kind of more of a regular he's still on 25 mil base but he's kind of more of my of a regular size juve um this is a dark like dark vengeance cultists the old monopose cultists um i scraped down all the chaos tattoos he had on him um and i gave him a goliath helmet and yeah he does work as my uh that's my juve. So yeah, if you're wondering, that's how you make those guys. Uh, let's go on to the Forgeborn. So Forgeborn is the the house-specific juve, the specialist juve. The Forgeborn does have a native movement 5 baked into his profile, so he is the fastest thing in your gang. I don't think by himself he's very good, but the slightly different profile means that he is a good basis for gene smithing. If you want to make some weird, uh, slightly different gang members, um, I think it's worth having a look at the Forgeborn for some new narrative choices for gene smithing. And because of the movement 5, he is the base for my trash goblin gene smithing. We'll have a look at that specific a bit later. And you can also check out my gene smithing video to see what a trash goblin is and how to make it rules wise. But the, the short version is that you take a Forgeborn and then you, um, make him a make him a uh, unborn and you give him proto goliath so he's got an increased movement so yeah trash goblins movement six gives you a bit of bit of variety in an otherwise very slow gang the other thing to keep in mind for forgeborn is that the official miniatures in the um stimmer forgeborn box they only have very bad weapon options they you get four of them but they've all got the double-handed saw or uh storm welder thingies um so if you want to take some cheap forgeborn or cheap bullies using those models be aware that you'll need to do some cutting and you know find like a couple of spare hands for them which is pretty annoying but you know it's the price you pay for being the best gang in every other aspect you know all right next up general roster revised Bru brutes beasts and hangers on so the Goliath Brutes, the unique Goliath Brute is called the Zerker. And yeah, he's basically like the Stimmer, but plus, you know, plus another 100% of drugs and muscle and hugeness. I don't think the model's very good. I don't think it's super exciting compared to some of the cool Brutes that the other gangs get. And rules-wise, he does everything a Stimmer does, but he does it worse and he does it for more credits. Yeah, if you like the if you like the Zerka, um, you know, go ahead, buy one, use one, love love him, give him a good home. But I don't like him, and I don't think he's very good. Uh, there you go. Next up, we have the Ogrin. As mentioned way back in the start of this video, Ogrin are slightly cheaper for Goliaths than other gangs, and the basic Ogrin comes with two augmented fists, kind of the big old uh, power fisty things. But you can give him a spud jacker, which gives him slightly, uh, makes him slightly cheaper. So yeah, you can have an Ogryn with a fist and a spud jacker, which gives you a really cheap option for 160 cred brute. If you want like a budget brute option, you've got a little bit of credits, but not enough to go all out. So that's, that's something to think about. But yeah, generally, Ambots are very good. I love an Ambot. They look cool. They're very good. Please enjoy an expensive Ambot, if it so pleases you. All right, let's go on to the beasts. The unique house pet for House Goliath is the Sump Croc. He is a sci-fi crocodile and therefore amazing, no notes. Yeah, I mean, I've seen other videos and other discussions about the Sump Croc, talking about whether he's good or not, and, you know, whether they like the model. But for me, you know, can I buy my man a crocodile? Yes, so I'm going to buy him a crocodile. Sorry, that's all you're getting from me. I love him. Yeah, the only bad thing about it is you can't take a full crocodile gang. Uh, sad. But yeah, I love him. I think he's cool. Use-wise, he's basically like a counter-charge unit. Um, so theoretically, you could put him on like a ranged leader or a ranged heavy guy. 
but then he's just hanging out at the back and he doesn't get to eat anybody. So yeah, I put him on as like a little um, buddy to hang around with my stim up, um, big boy with the big crocodile. Is he worth the points or the credits? That's a possible, possibly, possibly not. Is he amazing? Yes. Turns out I actually had a lot of notes, so sorry about that. All right, so let's move on to the hangers-on. You have so many hangers-on, um, so I'm not going to go through all of them. But here are a couple of really good ones. So chem dealers, any any gang can have the chem dealer, but he's a lot cheaper for House Goliath. So yeah, chem dealer gets you some slightly better uh, options for buying drugs from the trading post. And he's got some special rule where he can potentially get you some drugs at the start of a match, but then you have to pay him back. But basically forget about that, because the main point of taking a chem dealer is he has the fixer skill. Fixer skill, if you don't know, it means that after every game you roll d3 times 10 and that's you get more credits for that. Even if the person with the fixer skill is not in the battle, as long as they're not in recovery, you get those credits. And the chem dealer costs 25 credits, so you know, big do some big brain maths and you'll see that he's basically a great investment. After your first game or two, if you got a few credits lying around, 25 credits, it's a pretty good choice to buy a chem dealer. Um, bit gamey, he won't really, you know, maybe not as flashy as some other options, but yeah, he's a good investment. And then the other one to think about is the rogue doc. Uh, rogue docs are basically always good to keep your gangers alive. Having gangers die is bad for their health, and rogue docs can prevent that. So yeah, not essential, but think about it. Recommended. All right. And yeah, so this is actually the reason why I decided to make this video. If you're new to Necromunda and you're new to Goliath or any gang, after you've played your first game and you're looking at the, you know, the trading post and the house lists and all this kind of stuff and you've got some credits, it can get a bit overwhelming. So this is my advice for what to do after your first, first game or two. This is not, I mean, my, this entire video is just my opinion and my kind of uh, biased advice based on my own experiences, obviously. But this one is very much, even more so than the rest of the video, just a uh, rough guideline. So don't take this as gospel, but if you are completely lost and you're not really sure, then this these are some things to think about. So yeah, first up, get more bodies. And this is true for any gang, I think. I think it's generally a good idea to try and expand until you have around like 10 to 12 strong uh, gang. Basically, you want to give yourself enough bodies to survive a bad game and still be able to go into the next one with a strong roster. When you reach that point, your gang is, I mean, nobody's safe. You're always going to be at the mercy of some bad rolls, but, you know, you can kind of relax when you're at that point. Um, you want to have enough, enough gangers that you can have one or two deaths and not be completely crippled. You also want to as a kind of round out, rounding out uh, thing for your whole roster, to round out your roster, sorry. Uh, you also want to get a strong close combat presence. So I would recommend in your kind of entire gang, get, try and get yourself two or three real close combat monsters, things like Stimmers or your leader. And then you also want some support. Um, so support in this situation means gangers with uh, stub guns and axes or something like that, just some cheap bodies or some cheap juves to follow your close combat monsters in, do some supporting charges, you know, soak bullets for them. Yeah, so work on getting a few gangers to fill out that role. But next, next uh, section, don't neglect long range options. And when you've got a few credits, you want to get yourself a few bolt guns and the previously mentioned grenade launcher or two, you're not going to be murdering people at range in the same way that um, House Van Saar does, but you do want the ability to do a little bit of hurt at range and, more importantly, control. You want to be able to pin people and make them keep their heads down so that your close combat guys can get in close and get those charges off. Next up, smoke grenades. They're a little bit expensive, so yeah, your opinion may change, 
as to whether smoke grenades are useful in the starting gang or you know after the first game or two but you definitely want to get some smoke grenades sooner or later yeah you put down the template and it stays there so you block incoming fire and let help you get into close combat without getting shot once you've ticked all of those boxes i would say that you're probably at a stage when you can start spending money on uh, luxuries so this is stuff like am you know brutes or ambots um crocodiles you know go crazy and buy a heavy weapon you know buy the real expensive choices when you're at that stage but yeah as i mentioned this is not completely exhaustive some options i haven't mentioned such as uh the hangers on which you you may want to get or you may want to skip completely but mostly just have fun like there's no wrong way to do it as long as you're building the gang in a way that you enjoy and your opponents are having a good time as well. Uh, yeah, that's the main goal of Necromunda. Right, so on to hobby tips. So this is another thing that a lot of uh, tactics articles don't talk about too much. So this is some stuff to know about the sprue when you're, you know, gluing a Goliath gang together. So first up, first piece of advice, Space Marine weapons and also hands, if necessary, are the right size for Goliaths. So if you have a Space Marine army or you know someone with a Space Marine army, you know, rummage through the bits box and you can steal some bolt guns and bolt pistols and all that kind of thing. They're a great source of um, weapons. Yeah, you can see this dude at the back here. Um, he's my Heavy Bolter champion. This Heavy Bolter was from the, uh, I think he was the Mark IV um, Horus Heresy Space Marine and his actual hand is like still the space marine hand i just painted it up like a kind of bionic arm and glued it onto a goliath arm so yeah space marine parts highly recommended for uh goliath kit bashing just came into my head now i forgot to write it down but the other thing to look at is orc parts so in my opinion orc weapons are too big for goliaths i think they look they le they lean too much towards the kind of comedy oversized weapons so I don't think they look quite right in Goliath hands but if you have an orc bits box that you can look through this guy here he's this shoulder pads from an orc orc shoulder pads orc little bits of armor um yeah have a look at those they fit quite nicely with the Goliath aesthetic I think uh, next big point is corpse grinder cults are basically the right size for Goliaths Goliaths are huge Corpse grinders are huge, um, they work perfectly. So if you have a look at these guys down here, I'm hoping you can see the cursor by the way. Yeah, this guy is basic Goli uh, Goliath ganger body, and this guy is a basic corpse grinder cultist body with, uh, this is a corpse grinder axe as a chain axe, a uh, Goliath head, and a Goliath uh, grenade launcher. Yeah, the arms are to scale, the hands are to scale. They're not compatible in terms of like how they plug in. So you'll need to do a bit of um, bit of cutting or, you know, sanding or gluing or green stuffing to make them work. But yeah, they are highly recommended. Corpse Grinder Cults also are, in my opinion, a great source of counts as chain axes. So in typical Games Workshop fashion, as I mentioned before, one of the best weapons, close combat weapons in the game, is probably the chain axe. And can you buy a chain axe model? Uh, no. Like, chain axes are absent from maybe all of the weapon packs. I don't think they were in any of the Forge World weapon packs either. Um, Space Marines don't really have them. As I'm making this video, the World Eaters are not out yet. So if you're watching this in the future and world eaters are everywhere and the world is awash in many amazing chain axe bits, then, you know, disregard. But as it stands, chain axes are kind of a pain in the ass to find. But if you want to get some plastic chain axes, I recommend, yeah, use the weirdo saw things that the corpse grinders have. Yeah, they fit and they look cool, I think. And then finally, Corpse Grinder Cultist Initiates. These are the little um, Juve guys. I feel like they're not a bad... They, they might be a good base for Juve conversions if you want to do that. Um, and then finally, something to ask yourself and also probably your 
campaign manager and your other players. Um, Goliath Dudes, 25 mil or 32 mil bases. So the Forgeborn come on 25 mil bases. I personally like Juves on 25 mil bases. I think it's a good visual look when you have like the you know the younger members on the smaller bases and the big muscly guys. They're the more veteran gang members. I think that's a really cool look for the gang. But bully stats are the most important bully stats in game are the same as the bruisers. Like your you got your movement for, you've got your strength and toughness for, you got your weapon skill for. So I think a case could be made for um, bullies just being looking exactly like a regular bruiser on a 32 mil base. Obviously, before the Stimmers and the Forgeborn were released by Games Workshop, there were no official Juve models, so you just had to use the basic gangers as the Juves. So, yeah, um, something to think about. I don't think there's any correct answer. I don't think there's been an official. Uh, stance on it so yeah if you have an opinion on that um, let me know down below uh, in the old comment section but yeah as you watching a video planning to make a goliath gang it's pretty much up to you but check with uh, who you're going to be playing games with you know double check with them that they're cool with what you're doing all right next up it's time for example starting gangs yeah this is the good stuff right this is why you watch the video so first one basically i thought of a, a few different variations of where people might be in terms of mon models and weapons they have access to when they're starting to play necromanda and this one is a one box WYSIWYG gang if you are not aware what WYSIWYG means it means what you see is what you get so this means that everything in this list can be built from one uh, box. It comes on the sprue. You don't need to do any cutting. You don't need to do any counts as. You can make this gang and they look like this and they're ready to go. So this is really nice for people who, yeah, don't want to mess around with uh, cutting or maybe they don't have access to as many bits as uh, as people with, you know, long-standing multi-year uh, problems with buying Warhammer stuff <laughs> like me. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so this is a one box WYSIWYG gang. First up, we got Forge Tyrant. He's got the Power Hammer and the Stub Plaz Pistol, uh, which, yeah, I like this combination. I think this is a really good loadout for a Forge Tyrant. Uh, I've given him Furnace Plates, a Stim Slug Stash, so you can pop that when you want to charge in, get the extra movement, hit hard, destroy whatever you get in, and he's got the Nerves of Steel skill. Next up, we've got Forge Boss. Uh, giving him the renderizer, that's the big old double-handed chain axe thingy. And he's also got furnace plates and a stim slug, stim slug stash. And yeah, he will also be trying to get in there and uh, pop in the stim slug stash for the extra movement so we can get in. These two are your main, you know, close combat terrors. And then uh, as a second champion, we've got the forge boss with the grenade launcher, a brute cleaver and some furnace plates. So this gives you a little bit of a long range um, crowd control. You can mess around with people uh, by dropping uh, grenades on their heads and pinning them. And then if you go out of ammo with a grenade launcher, you've got the brute cleaver. Or if you get charged, he can still do some fighting in close combat. And I've given him nerves of steel as well. Yeah, I mentioned Nerves of Steel before, that it's a really good one, and this is kind of like a super beginner. This is a good gang for uh, someone who's completely new to Necromunda, I think. Nerves of Steel, it is very good. It's very easy to use. Um, yeah, so let's just go Nerves of Steel for this gang. Then we got two bruisers armed with stub guns and spud jackers, and two bruisers armed with combat shotguns. So I had a look at the sprue and I'm pretty sure the you'll have like the stub gun in one hand and the spud jacker in the other. So that's why I chose that combination because you can build it out of the box. Um, the brute cleaver is I think maybe on a different hand so um, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to cut and cut that and get that on a different hand. So yeah let's just go with stub gun and spud jacker. And then we've got two guys with combat shotguns. Combat shotguns are amazing. Love combat shotguns. The models are carrying combat shotguns in one hand, so you will need to, I think, probably give him, give these models, like, holding the grenades in the other hand, so it's not, not 100% WYSIWYG, but, you know, 99%. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so this, you, you can build this in one box. I think it's pretty solid gang. It covers all your bases. You're not really missing out on too much. You can definitely go into this and win some games and have a good time. Ah, yeah, the other thing about this list is it comes to 980 credits. So you've got a bit of room, uh, room for your own personal spin on it. So 20 credits left over. You got a few choices. Choice number one, you can you can keep it in the bank. It's not a terrible idea to have a few credits in the bank for your first game. You know, if someone needs to go to the hospital, or you can spend those credits. If you know you get a few get a good winnings, you get a you have a few more in the bank, so you can get a little bit closer to buying a new guy or something like that. So yeah, just keeping the credits left over isn't a bad choice. Uh, another thing you can do is you can buy a smoke grenades for the grenade launcher. This is again not a bad choice. Maybe buy him a stub gun as well in case the grenade launch goes out of ammo. And the other option that I recommend for your leftover credits is buy the the four bruisers. They can each get some furnace plates, and then you get armor save on everybody. Yeah, it's up to you which one you want to go for. Yeah, there you go. All right, let's go on to the next one. So this is one box and a bit of converting gang. So same as before, we've got one box of Goliaths, but this is making the assumption that you have access to some bits boxes. Nothing too crazy in terms of like rare bits, but you know, some Space Marine bits that you might be able to steal from a friend or, you know, Maybe you don't mind doing a bit of counts as or a bit of uh, cutting and gluing or anything like that, a bit of converting. So yeah, for this one, we've got a Forge Tyrant and he's got a Bolt Gun and a Brute Cleaver. So yeah, you'll need to source the Bolt Gun from somewhere else. Um, and I've given him Furnace Plates and Dermal Hardening. Yeah, so in the previous gang as well, I skipped over Gene Smithing. You know, keep it simple. But this one, we're going to be playing around with a little bit of gene, gene smithing. You know, a bit of a taste. Dermal hardening gives him plus one toughness. So this guy can wade through some fire. He can murder people with a bolt gun. And he can get up close with a brute cleaver. And he's got nerves of steel because nerves of steel is really good. Next up, we've got a forge boss. He's got a renderizer, furnace plates, stim slug stash. And then I've given him gene smithing, uh, natborn and I've bought him the Prime Specimen upgrade and used this to give him plus one move. And I've given him Berserker skill, which is plus one attack on the charge. So he's got a movement of five because of his gene smithing. Stim Slug Stash will give him a bonus of two for the charge round. And Berserker gives him bonus attack on the charge. So yeah, he's uh, surprisingly fast, bit of a bit of a different way to play him. And then a uh, forge boss with a grenade launcher. Um, he's got smoke grenades, so you can play around with blocking blocking uh, fire. I've given him furnace plates and the unstoppable skill. Yeah, keep him up a little bit longer. Mostly these skills are not nerves of steel, just, you know, to be a bit different. But if you prefer nerves of steel, just take nerves of steel, you know. So yeah, let's have a look at this thing here where I've written chainsword. I'm sure there are a lot of people pretty pretty grumpy about me suggesting buying a chainsword. So chainswords, if you don't know, are the exact same cost as a chain axe, but chainswords are uh, worse in every way. Chain axes are just exactly the same as chainswords, but the same price and better. So why would you ever get a chainsword? Well, number one, it looks cool. But the main reason I put it in this list is because chainswords are a lot easier to source in terms of bits. You know, if you have a friend or yourself maybe who has um, Space Marine Army, it won't be too difficult to find a chainsword. So stick it on the force forge boss. If you have, if you can find yourself a chain axe, or you know maybe you do a bit of the old 3D printing, um, something like that, and you want, you can get yourself a chain axe. Definitely take the chain axe. But chainswords are easier to um, easier to find out in the wild. So um, I chose that's the reason for that choice. Then we got two bruisers with stub guns and axes. Um, relatively cheap. Axes are quite nice. They can move up with your forge boss and tyrant. Um, do a bit of charging. And we got a bruiser with a combat shotgun and a specialist with a grenade launcher. So you're starting with two grenade launchers, some close combat threat, bit of an all-rounder forge tyrant, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's another gang. Should we go on to the next one? 
So next up, this is assuming that you've bought both boxes. So the basic Goliath box, the uh, Stimmer and uh, Forge Bond box. And you've also bought the Games Workshop Plastic upgrade kit. I'm not, I'm ignoring the or, uh, Forge World resin upgrade kits because, I don't know, some of them are out of print now. Um, and, you know, resin's a pain in the ass. So yeah, you bought both boxes, you bought the upgrade pack, you can make this gank. So we got Forge Tyrant, um, I've given him a Power Axe and a Melter Gun, despite saying it's ridiculous and overpriced, but you got to do that sometimes, right? Um, so there isn't a, an official Power Axe in any of these kits, but just use the regular axe, um, do a bit of counts as, or maybe, you know, find some bits or something like that, uh, stick some wires in that, or just, you know, say it's a Power Axe, no one's going to give you any shit about that, trust me. Giving him furnace plates, dermal hardening for plus one toughness, and nerves of steel. Um, yeah, he's really expensive, probably too much, but you know, Forge Tyrant with a melter gun will be terrifying to play against. Then we got two stimmers. One stimmer has got paired pul pulverizers and furnace plates, and I've given him bull charge. So bull charge gives you plus one strength and knockback. And the second stimmer has got paired spud jackers, so it make them, makes them a bit cheaper. Furnace plates and nerves of steel. So bull charge gives you knockback. The spud jackers give you knockback as well. And if you knock someone, if you knock the opponent back, but they can't go back because there's a wall or another model in the way, they get plus one damage. So you've got a bit of a tech play here where you can charge in your two stimmers. You can smash someone into a wall with all your knockback and um, do even more damage. You know, just a bit of a fun way to play that. And we got two bruisers with stub guns and axes. Again, cheap and cheerful. Bruiser with a shotgun. Yeah, the upgrade pack comes with a shotgun. I think it looks really cool, so uh, enjoy that shotgun. And then uh, finally we got a bruiser specialist with a grenade launcher and an axe, because you want a bit of ranged um, crowd control with the grenade launcher. And this is another thousand creds um, total, and yeah, those three examples, depending on what you have, what what you like, I think you can kind of mix and match that. You know, like um, you can take the stimmer and put it into a different list. You know, feel free to play around with it, but these should give you some ideas of some starting starting points. And then finally, uh, this is my personal starting gang. This is, I think, very similar to the gang that I started with in my previous previous campaign that I played in uh, with Goliaths. It did very well. I did get very lucky. Shout out to Rob, who rolled nothing but awful results when I played against him. Helped me get a lot of money, a lot of credits. Um, but yeah, this is a good gang, I think. This is, um, this is what I would play if I was going to start a new, a new campaign. So we got the Forge Tyrant. He's got the stub plasma pistol and he's got the power hammer. I like that. I think it looks cool. I rate it. Furnace plates and then we've got some gene smithing. We've given him Natborn and then we've given him the upgrade Iron Flesh, which gives him a bonus wound and Tyrant's own choosing movement and toughness. So he's got toughness five, he's got three wounds and he's got movement of five. So yeah, this guy is a terror. Yeah, he will not go down, and uh, we've taken, we've given him nerves of steel because, uh, yeah, nerves of steel is very good. Then we got a stimmer with the paired pulverizers, furnace plates, and nerves of steel. A forge boss with a grenade launcher and a chain axe, furnace plates, and nerves of steel. You know, a bit of all rounder to support the two close combat monsters. Uh, we got two bruisers with combat shotguns. One has an axe. One has a stub gun. Why? Uh, because that's how I built the models and I think it looks cool. When you see a list and it's just, you know, gang and las gun, gang and las gun, or whatever, I think it's a bit boring, so make each of your guys slightly different. It's more narrative, it's more fun, gives you more individual individuality, in my opinion. And then we've got a bruiser with a spud jacket and a stub gun. Again, generally I don't like stub spud jackers, having played with it, but I like the model, he's a cool guy, he makes the list. Then finally, the Trash Goblin, who I didn't actually write down the points value of that. Let me do that right now. Live on camera, I believe is 40 credits. Double check my work. You guys, hope that's your homework. 
Um, yeah, so Trash Goblin is, as we've said before, he starts with the Forge Born. I gave him a stub gun, and then he is Unborn. And then I've given him the Proto Goliath upgrade. Or side grade is maybe more accurate. Uh, so Proto Goliath gives him plus one movement, minus one strength, minus one toughness, minus one cool, plus two int, plus one willpower. Yeah, this, this is my so-called trash goblin template and the other thing that unborn gets which is a bit of a sneaky choice as you uh, play more games unborn gives you the uh, outsider ability and this means you get to choose another skill set which isn't normally available to goliaths and take it as a primary and for my trash goblin i took cunning so the plan is if he survives a few games he will be I'll buy him incendiary charges, I'm going to give him infiltrate, he'll be a little cheap-ass, suicidal, crazy-ass mutant goblin popping out of a vent right on top of the enemy, throwing incendiary bombs. Please note he's got strength minus one, which gives him strength two, so he's not going to be throwing the grenades very far, he's not going to be hitting anything, he's going to be setting himself on fire. I love it. This is, this is the reason why I play Necromunda. Completely ridiculous. Amazing stuff. Everyone gets set on fire. That is the end of the video. If you made it through the whole thing, thanks very much for watching. I hope this video proved to be uh, helpful and interesting to new players and hopefully helpful and interesting to older players as well. If you have any questions or anything that you're not sure about when, in regards to Goliaths, uh, yeah, please ask me in the comments. I'll do my best to read them all and answer them. If you're a Goliath veteran and you think that I missed something out or you want to give your own suggestions, do that down below as well. Uh, we're all Goliaths here. Everyone is about being friends and muscle friends with each other. If you have a request about which gang you'd like me to make an introduction video about next, also let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, I would very much appreciate a like and a subscription if it's not too much trouble. Uh, yeah, I'm still a small channel and so each little subscription really, really means a lot to me. Yeah, I love all of you, even you, yeah. Anyway, uh, have fun and bye!